Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. I get to work today. Is that all right? This is first time in five weeks I get a chance to swing the bat, so I'm going to swing for the fences. Y'all are going to be here till six o'clock tonight. No, you won't. You won't. But I'm glad to have the opportunity, and we'll try to remember how to do this. We, we. You say, well, I didn't know you were preaching. You never will. From now on, you never will. Jared and I have made an agreement. We're never going to say who's got Sunday, who's going to handle Sunday. So it should never matter who does. What should matter is what we say. So join with us for that. We, we bless you this morning. Uh, a couple of things, if you will, if you're new to us, uh, stop by the Information Center. We have a gift there for you. There's a lot going on in the month of October. October is going to be an especially busy month. Good month for fellowship, good month for community. All the, the Bible studies and small groups have all kicked back in. Everything is going again, so it's a good time to get in and get connected. If you're looking for a place to serve, there are so many places here to serve. We, I, I gave this in team talk, and I'll just pass it along to you. If you follow with us on Facebook, follow closely. Uh, because we've got some, some things that we are doing for people that have been affected by the, the storm. Uh, not only in Florida, some on the West Coast, but some on as far as up in the North Carolinas and that kind of thing. We have friends in those different places, so we're trying to find the best way to connect to them. But one of the ways that you can help us is that this week we are collecting until Wednesday. Another organization here in St. Augustine, We Feed, is going to be taking over a, a bunch of donations of whatever we have to... Uh, I think it's Steenhatchee. They're going to take it there where they were diversely affected by the storm. They were just devastated. So it's going to be on Wednesday. We're going to collect everything until then. So follow with us on Facebook. If you need to speak to somebody, you can find Kelsey or Jared, and they can tell you how that's going to work. There will be a box here that you can put everything into, and it's going to be a blessing to them and a blessing to us. Amen? We thank God for, for his provision and safety for us, but we... It's not enough to say to people, we'll be praying for you. It means the world when you step in and you do something. So we are those people, boots on the ground. We get stuff done. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book. That sounds weird, doesn't it? If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 1. And while you're turning there, let me, let me start a strong foundation as it relates to the book of Romans. I've come to believe this, that every disciple needs to have a firm grasp of the book of Romans. It, it isn't just something that should be on your yearly Bible reading schedule that you just give a little attention to, but it should be intentionally focused on because, if nobody's ever told you this, the book of Romans is the most systematic and concise presentation of the Christian doctrine in all of the Bible. Many times when, when people are saying, well, where should I start? A new convert says, where do I start? What should I read first? People are quick to say the Gospel of John because the, the Gospel of John is the Gospel of love. Fifty-six times in the book of John, the love of Jesus is referred to more than any of the other three Gospels combined. But I believe it's important for us to not only know that we are loved, but to know what we believe as well. It shows us, as we read through the book of Romans, the sinfulness of man, the way of salvation, justification by faith, the revelation of God, man's sin, judgment, faith, works, law, grace, redemption, justification, sanctification. It is all there in the book of Romans. There is no other book like it in your Bible. So if you're asking your pastor, where should I start reading? I say you should always go into the book of Romans because there you will find the doctrine that you need to know. For today, I want us to focus in on some passages starting in verse 21. If you would please in honor stand for the reading of the word together. Romans starting in chapter 1 verse 21. And a heads up, we are going to read a lot of scripture today. You won't die, I promise. The word of God says that although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. This is not written to people who don't know who God is. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as such, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and they changed. Verse 23, changed. That word literally means to make different. 
the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their flesh or their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged, watch this now, the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Leave that there, if you will, please. Verse 25 is our foundation for today. The scripture says they exchanged the truth of God for the lie. This morning, that will be what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about the exchange. The exchange. That word literally means to give up something for something else. It means to replace it. So when it says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, what that is literally saying is that they they gave up the truth for something else. And they replaced it. They replaced it. He who has an ear to hear. I'm praying this morning that you will hear. Not what you came to church hoping to hear, but that you will hear what the Spirit of God wants you to hear. The subject of their exchange is this. They changed the truth for the lie. Truth for lie. Father, give us today a word in due season. Let everything that we hear change us forever. And we thank you for it. And they said together in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. The inspiration for this word actually came several weeks ago when we were having our second men's meeting. Uh, We called it, for lack of a better title, Tacos and Testimonies. Uh, And what we did was I invited three men to come and share their stories. And I got to tell you, much to my surprise, I shouldn't have been, but to their credit, they were as honest and real as anyone that I've ever seen do that in that particular kind of a situation. I don't know if anyone has ever asked you to share your testimony or if you ever have been invited to share your testimony, but you know that when when someone asks you to do that, there is always this internal struggle that you have within yourself of, well, how much do I give? What do I let out? How much do I tell? Because if I say too much, nobody's going to want to sit by me at church. I don't know how real do you want me to be. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How how real? Come on, I know some of y'all grew up in church, but the rest of us. How real do you want me to be? I mean, do I give you the the seeker-friendly, cotton candy, apple pie, sanitized version? Or do you want me to rip the covers off and just show you everything that's all there at one time? No matter how many times you say it, it can never be said enough how important your story is. Your story is your story. It is nobody else. And nobody can tell you enough how important it is that you, that you be willing to share that story. Listen to me tell you this, warts and all. Sometimes you're tempted to give the sanitized version. And obviously it will be different wherever you are and wherever you happen to be sharing that story. But when God opens the door for you to be able to share that story, one of the things that you should do is take a deep breath and pray. And then let the Holy Spirit take control. And when you tell it, tell it all. Even the parts of your story that you don't want anybody to know about. The stuff that you don't want the church to know. The stuff you certainly don't want your children or your pastor to know. Uh, because this is, this is reality here. I, I like to deal in reality. We are not all the same. Even right here in this building. We know this. I know this standing here looking at you. There are people who have grown up righteous. Don't be ashamed of that. There are people in in the room and and some who will watch this later who have grown up righteous. The identity, so much of the identity that you have is righteous. You grew up with church. You grew up with God and faith and virtue and morals and all of that. It's just natural to you. It's as natural to you as drawing your next breath. That's how you grew up. My mother was like that. Uh, My mother was a saint that she never, I never heard her raise her voice. I never heard her say a bad word. She was just born and raised in it. But I also know this also, that the vast majority of us did not. I'll wait. 
the vast majority of us, our story is more about how much we ran from God than how much we ran to God. Our story is about falling and failing and then rising back up. And it's about redemption. It's about mistakes and mercy. It's about problems and pig pens. I'm going to get real before I get out of here. It may be my last one, but I'm going to do it. That's why when they sing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, it hits different because they sing it from a lifetime of, of walking with him and holding his hand and blessed Jesus hold my hand. They, they sing it from a lifetime of that, but when I sing Amazing Grace, I sing it like a prodigal son who knows what a pig pen smells like and who knows how humiliating it is to wake up in that pig pen. We're going to take communion today. When that first group takes communion, the, the good folks, they just drink from the cup. And they're just so thankful for the mercy that God's given them. But when you drink from that same cup, the mercy that you feel hits you differently because you were a mess when he saved you. Anybody else? Regardless of your experience, regardless, let me encourage you. I'm going to go there. Let, let, let me encourage you to get your story ready. Look at your neighbor and say, get your story ready. That way you can never say, nobody told me. Because someone needs to hear it. And trust me, you're going to be telling it. You may not be ready to hear this. But right now, whether you see it or not, God is raising up the others. He is. Last week while I was watching Jared operate in that anointing that just blew up in him. Were y'all here? Good God Almighty. God reminded me of a conversation right in the middle of that that I had with my pastor years and years ago when I was 21 years old. I had just left law enforcement. I was a, I was a dog. I had just left law enforcement. I had gone into ministry and I had no idea what in the world I was doing or supposed to be doing. I was still a mess inside. My mind was all jacked up. My thoughts were messed up. And I just asked my pastor, I said, I don't understand why God called me. I'm a mess. I don't know what I'm doing. I, every thought that I have is, is bad. I'm a mess. And my pastor looked back at me and he said, that is exactly why God called you. My pastor said that God was calling people like me because when he called the other ones, they all said no. Uh-oh. I believe that same thing is happening right now. God is once again raising up somebody else. God is raising up the others because he's done with religious snobs and Pharisees who can pray pretty prayers but judge everybody all at the same time. God's raising up somebody else. He's raising up people who understand the mercy of God. God doesn't call people who say to him, well, it's about time you figured out I'm ready. God calls people who say, no, 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 no. Would you get somebody else? I'd rather sit in the seat and do nothing, but God's going to call you anyway. So I say, get ready to tell your story. And know this, I'm taking too long on this, but it's all right. That every time you tell whatever story it is that you are going to tell, it doesn't do everything that you think it's going to do. It does a whole lot more. Every time you tell your story, it makes you stronger than you were before you started. Every time you tell your story. Chains are going to fall off of somebody else when they hear that. It's a blessing to know that the road that you walked will spare somebody else the pain that you had to go through because you went through it and now you tell them. That took way too long, but that's my foundation. In this testimony, one of the men told his story, and he talked about the lies of the devil in your life. The lies of the devil in your life. And how it is that the enemy just weaves, listen to me, lie after lie after lie into your life. He just weaves it in there. That, that's a seed here. A thought there. Uh, an experience happens. Deception. Rejection. Oppression. Temptation. And although we know he works differently each time, his goal isn't always to just come rushing in and overwhelm you all at once. Sometimes his best strategy is to play the long game. 
Hang with me. Sometimes his strategy is to play the long game, meaning that he knows that he can't change everything all at once. He can't just bust in and completely overthrow an entrenched belief system that you have. In other words, if you are a person of, of morality and you have morals inside of you, the, the enemy somehow knows that he cannot just bust in and knock that over. He knows it. He can't quickly make an entire, listen, society abandon their morality. Can't do it. Because if he did, there would be an instant uprising. If, you, if he stepped in and said, well, you know, we just want to overthrow everything, there would be an uprising. He can't quickly make that happen, and so he plays the long game. A change here. A little compromise there. A little change in this. A new thing. A doubt. A question. A maybe. A maybe. That he just drops down there that... that causes you to question what was once an absolute. The initial strategy of the serpent in the Garden of Eden is exactly that. Well, now, has God really said that? It, it, come on now. Is that how it really is? Is that, is that actually the truth? This doesn't seem to be so bad, so why are you so worried about it? It's just a little thing. It's just a, take a bite. It, it's not a, that big of a, of, of a deal. And what's the big deal anyway? And eventually, what happens is that what was once solid becomes shaken. And then, once something has been shaken, it becomes weakened. And once it becomes weakened, then it becomes doubted. And eventually, it is, to use our word for the hour... It is exchanged. It is replaced. Y'all hang with me this morning because it's about to get a little bumpy in here. That is our current culture. You and I have the distinction of knowing this, that we live in a replacement culture. We live in a culture that is determined to replace and exchange. I don't like this. I want something else. You know, when we grew up in, in, in Little St. Augustine, there were maybe five or ten restaurants. And so if you wanted something to eat, you had to go to each one of those or one of those to eat something. But now there's 37 hamburger joints just on your street alone. And so if you don't like this one, you could go to that one. And so I, I don't like how, I know that's how it's been, but I don't like it now. <laughs> I, in exchange, we can... <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. It's, 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 it's our church. We can do it. We're just talking to us. I'm not too fond of that new preacher. That's what they're saying. Did you know? Did you know? <laughs> I didn't mean me, Heifer. I meant in general. It's been, you know, that boy's had some enemies. Can you believe that? He's had some enemies, actually. In the last few months. But, but did you know that church hopping did not exist in the New Testament church until recently? It did not. It did not. In the, in the initial New Testament church, you didn't just get mad at your pastor and run off and go to the church that, down the street that you wanted to go to. You know why? Because it was three months away. In Asia Minor, if you wanted to leave your church and go to another church, you had to walk for three months to get there. And so in the first century, the apostles, thank God for them, taught us a work it out doctrine. So if you have a problem, you work it out. You work it out. You don't replace it. You don't exchange it. You work it out. Touch your neighbor and say, work it out. Work it out. Back to the sermon. Every day now, we look at our culture. And as we shake our heads, we ask ourselves, how did we get here? How did we get from where I was born in 1961? How in God's name did we get from where I was to where we are now? My dad died in, in, in May of 2020. 24 years ago. 
And I'll promise you this, that if my dad was to suddenly somehow come back to life again and show back up in this world that he is in right now, he would not be able to believe what we are demonizing and what we are celebrating. My dad would not believe it. Morality is demonized. Immorality is celebrated. Good is evil and evil is good. We call the right things wrong and we call all the wrong things right. And we are willing to die on the hill of all the wrong things, but won't say anything about all the right things. It is an exchange. The exchange is almost complete. It's happening right now. You see it every day, even if you don't recognize it. How did we start with, well, we just want to be recognized. We don't want any special privileges. We don't want any of that. We just want to be recognized. And now we ended up with, if you don't recognize and agree and cater to us, it is a hate crime and you are the problem. And not only will you go to jail, but we will sue you and shut your business down and take everything that you own. How did we get from here to there? How did we make the switch from tolerance to tyranny? We started with, well, if you want to do this, you can't. We highly recommend that you do it. But we ended up with, if you don't, you're the problem. And you can go to jail. How did we go from men are men and women are women to a place where identity is such a challenge in our culture? How did we go from children are the most vulnerable and precious possessions that we have, and they must be protected at all costs to the place where now you know this is true. The womb is the most dangerous place for a child to be. Did you know that? And even if they are born, children are now unprotected, sexualized, and legislators are doing everything that they can to lower the age for them to be able to have sex with adults. California, just last week, passed a law that a 21-year-old man can now have sex with an 11-year-old child, and it is not pedophilia. That's the world that we live in. How did we get... Y'all buckle in. How did we get to the place where we talk about abortion as a virtue? Oh, y'all got quiet now. Instead of calling it what it is. And whenever you bring that up, someone is quick to tell me that since I don't have a uterus, I shouldn't have an opinion. But yet in the next breath, we'll affirm someone who doesn't have a uterus who identifies themselves as something else. The list goes on, and I'm, I'm not going to spell it all out because we all know it, but when the question is asked, how did this happen? How did we get from there to here? Romans chapter 1. A 2,000-year-old document that so many people call irrelevant delivers the answer. There has been an exchange. We have exchanged truth for lie. Romans 1. In Romans chapter 1, Paul is providing not just a revelation of rebellion, but an intentional rebellion, and he gives us the result of that rebellion right in front of our faces. If you have your Bible, still open it up with me. Romans chapter 1, starting with verse 18, we're going to read this together. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, because God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Stop right there. What makes this so damnable is that he's speaking about people who have an understanding of who God is. Let's read the word. Verse 19. What may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, 
God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. When you walk through that, you can clearly see every word being fulfilled, verses 19 and 20. Everything about God, it says, is clearly seen. His eternal nature and his divine nature is clearly seen. But even though they knew him as God, they did not glorify him as God. Can I say to the church this morning that you and I should never miss an opportunity to give God glory? Come on now, not just in church, but wherever you are. At school, at home, in the workplace, in Walmart, you should never miss an opportunity to give God some kind of a glory. You should never miss the chance to look hell in the face and say, not today, devil. It's not going to be like that. You should never miss an opportunity even just to look up and say, God, I just want to thank you for another day. Never miss a chance to give God the glory that he deserves. I don't think we give God nearly enough glory in our lives. You should be glorifying him right now because he woke you up this morning and let you have this day to give him praise. You should thank God that you're not in jail. Amen? We should never miss an opportunity. Never miss an opportunity to give God... Come on, y'all. Verse 23. They changed. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Where are the old folks? (laughs) Nobody will say nothing. (laughs) The older I get, the clearer this becomes. That there is a never-ending attempt to minimize God. I've seen it my whole life. Let's minimize God and bring him down to our level. Because if God is on my level, then I can control him. I, can. I was reading the St. Augustine News the other day. Don't do it. I was reading in the St. Augustine News the other day, and somebody actually posted this thing, a question. She said, you know, we all pray, and we all pray to God to help us with our problems. She said, but does anybody ever stop to think to pray for God? I backed it up and I read it again. She said, we should pray to God for God. Brothers and sisters. The moment that you think God needs you to pray for him, he is no longer God. God doesn't need you. Like God sitting up on his throne, wringing his hands, I sure wish someone would pray for me. No, that's never going to happen. He is God Almighty. What that says to me is that we need another revelation of the greatness of God in our lives. We've minimized God and tried to bring him down to our level. God is not going to be on our level. The only way he did is that he came as a son. He came as Jesus. You need to sing it until it makes sense in your life. How great is our God? He's the one who made the sun, the moon, the stars, and the heavens. He is almighty God. There is not anything that he needs from us. He is God all by himself. The outcome is seen in verse 25. It brought about an exchange. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And from there, from that... From the moment of that exchange until the end of the chapter is our, listen to your pastor, an everyday reality in 2024. Worshiping one another, vile affections, immorality, no limits. Read with me, verse 29 through 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. This didn't happen until the exchange. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, Mm. without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, 
who knowing the judgment of God that they would commit such things are worthy of death, not only do this thing, but have pleasure in them that do that. And it all started with an exchange. All of that came about as a result of that exchange. And, and, and what was the exchange again? The truth for a lie. It all started when they exchanged the truth of God with a lie. Now, you could say that as a sermon. We could call for the benediction. We could say some prayers. We could go home and we'd feel good about ourselves. But what's burning in me is that we who know the truth, and let me talk openly to the household of God, we, those of us who know the truth, we who know the truth, I'm going to say it until it makes sense, we who know the truth should be willing, obedient, and strong enough to ask for the same spirit that dwelled on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and do our part to flip it all back like it needs to be. And the church, and the church shouts, Amen! But forgets that there is sometimes a fiery furnace attached to that action. Oh yeah, come on, let's do it. Our challenge now, in our time, is to exchange the lie with the truth. See, back, back, back in the day, they exchanged the truth for the lie. Our challenge now, as the church, are y'all with me, is to exchange the lie and replace it with the truth. And that's where it gets real tricky. Because now we have indulged in the lie for so long. Oh, we kind of like it. If you don't think so, say something on Facebook. <laughs> all hell's about to break loose. They all come running at you. We have indulged in the lie for so long that the moment you bring up the truth, you are the antagonist. You are the problem. How dare you? You hypocritical, bigoted, racist, judgmental hypocrite. You become the problem. <laughs> Four weeks ago, they bumped him off of TikTok for just simply saying the truth. When I was a young man, I was told, that a lie told long enough soon becomes accepted as the truth. See, right off the bat, you tell a lie, and everybody who knows the difference is going to go, uh-uh, no, 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 that's not, that's not. Uh -uh. But if you keep telling that same, <laughs> watch NBC, CBS, ABC. Them dogs will lie right straight up in your face and think you're too stupid to play a videotape back and hear them saying the exact opposite of what they're saying now and look at you like they're not lying to you. They're lying to you. A lie told long enough soon becomes accepted as the truth. Paul said that there would come a day when we would finally turn the truth into a lie. And here we are. In the book of Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah said that truth has fallen in the streets. It means it is wavering. It is decayed right there in our streets. The truth. Is anybody in the house interested in the truth? The truth of the word of God is that there are not many ways into heaven. There is only one. There are not many ways that you can get into heaven. There are not many heavens. There is only one. The truth is that there is only one God and only one way. And his name is Jesus Christ. He is the son of God. The truth. The truth. It's just simple. The truth is that the Bible is and always has been the word of God. And we, well, there are parts of it that I don't agree with. He doesn't care. It's his book. He wrote it like he wanted it to be said and spoken and lived out. If the Bible, y'all ain't ready for this. If the Bible said it was sin then, then by God, it is sin now. It is not changed. It's still sin. It's still sin. The, the, Y'all hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. The truth is that there is no reason to put a tampon dispenser in a men's restroom. Am I the only one taking crazy pills here? 
we don't know what to do with that. We don't need that. It's not necessary. Don't put it in here. The truth. Truth is a man is a man and a woman is a woman. It's XXXY. That's what it is. Don't cite, don't cite COVID and then demand that I pay attention to the science. And I'm getting ready to get kicked off of something. And then selectively deny. And then selectively deny the science of biology. Don't work like that. The truth is that you must be born again. Everybody in this church, everybody watching me, listen to me right now. Don't ever say nobody told you, you must be born again. Imagine on the day of judgment. At the moment of their realization that not only have I believed the lie, but the people who knew the truth didn't stand up for it. I can't live with that. The people that knew the truth did not dare to say it because they didn't want to get canceled. They didn't want to be called a bigot. You know why people are so bound up today? People are so bound up today, not because there is more sin and sin is better than it always has been. People are bound up today because we have slapped a muzzle on the truth. We have, y'all say amen, we have slapped a muzzle on the truth. We want people who know the truth to just sit down and keep your mouth shut and just don't say nothing. And if you start saying something, then here they come. Even help me Jesus might be my last one but it's going to be a good one even when a preacher tries to say something they spend five minutes explaining why they're not trying to be hateful they're just trying to explain what the Bible says it's almost like they're apologizing for what the word of God we don't need to apologize for what the word of God actually says we just need to say it we just need to say it and you might not like the way that we deliver it. He yells too much. They, they got mad at him, said he yells too much. Have y'all ever heard me preach? I scream everything. I scream my introduction. Just say it. Because the truth is the mechanism that sets the captives free. When you speak the truth, the chains start to fall off. When you speak the truth, blinded eyes start to open up. People who are in the captivity of sin start to be set free. Because of truth. Believers need a heart check about the truth. Us too. He's doing a great job. But let's keep it going. What I'm proposing is an intentional shift in boldness. Super proud. I was super proud of them, the, the man he is and the preacher he is becoming. Super proud. We need to pump the brakes on that seeker friendly stupidity and become known as speakers and beacons of the truth. You may not like it, but you will respect it. The truth of God. They have exchanged the truth for a lie. And while we're exchanging things, it's not just a few things that we exchange, not just good for bad, but we can exchange some bad for good. Y'all want to exchange some bad things for some good things. I am trading my sorrow for joy. Somebody needs to hear what I'm saying. You can exchange sorrow for joy, fear for faith, pain for purpose. In my life for the last few months, I have decided that I am going to exchange surface relationships for deeper relationships. And I'm trading in every fake friend I've ever had for real friends who are there with you all the time. I'm trading. I'm exchanging. I'm exchanging my weakness for his strength. And it's already happened to me, so I'm going to say I'm exchanging comfort for obedience. That's the part I'm sick of the most. Exchanging comfort for obedience. I loved being comfortable. Singers, y'all, y'all come on. I worked 42 years in ministry to get right here. It was comfortable. <laughs> it was comfortable. Sitting out here on 207 in this magnificent edifice. Y'all know we started over on South Whitney Street, right? With seven people. In a little neighborhood called Hog Wallow. <laughs> Nobody wanted to come to that church. They couldn't even find that church. They were afraid they were going to steal the tires off of their car in the parking lot. 
We worked for three years to get over to Kings of States Road. Hallelujah. We got a neighborhood church. Come on. We out of that neighborhood. Kings of State Road is just as bad. There's a bunch of thugs and hooligans over there. We were constantly getting broke into. We got here in 2002. Built the building, moved in in 2004. Worked for 20 years to get here. I've confessed it over and over again. Comfortable. Everything's paid for. We don't owe anybody a dime. This church is debt free. No, we were. <laughs> and then some knucklehead. Hey, Dad, I feel called. Stay right where you're at. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep stringing line. You're safer handling a 60,000 volt electrical transformer than you are dealing with church folk. You, right? Sheep bite. Church folk, the only people who will smile in your face and cut your throat at the same time and think they're doing God's work. That's actually in the Bible. You know that, right? The Word of God says there will come a time when those who kill you say they're doing God's work. Anyway, that's a whole other sermon. <laughs> Punk comes to me and says, I feel called. Oh, that's really cool. Hey, Dad. Let's buy some land. We don't have enough room here. This is not big enough. The vision you have. The vision, the vision that he has cannot be contained here. People can get mad about it if you want to. I just like a small church. That's too bad. Everything that is alive grows. Lost people need to be one to Jesus. And if you start winning lost souls to Christ, well, you have a parking problem. So let's buy some land. Hokey dope. Sounds cool. We bought it. Hey, Dad. <laughs> Shut up. Let's preach with such conviction that everyone hates us. Well, that don't make sense. No, that don't make sense. No, I got to at least have somebody who likes us. No, let's preach hell and everybody will hate us. Well, okay. And you know what? He's right. Saints and sinners are, they're mad. They're just mad. This is burning in my heart. They have exchanged the truth for a lie. We need to exchange the lie for the truth. This church is going to do that. We're going to stand flat-footed on the Word of God. Come hell or high water, come what may, we're going to preach the truth. And the truth is going to set people free. The truth is going to set the captives free. And you're going to see it. You're going to see it. You're going to live with it. Now, you can, you can get mad and, and, and run for safety if you want to. But that's up to you. But if you stay in this thing long enough, I'm telling you, we saw a spirit of revival in here last Sunday. You're going to see that same spirit over and over again. So this morning, my heart is burning in this direction. They exchange the truth of God for the lie. We need to exchange the lie for the truth. Knowing that the truth is what sets people free. Freedom is in our future. Freedom is the children's bread. Freedom from captivity, freedom from sin, freedom from shame, freedom from disgrace, to be free. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done, your word be heard. Let us do your work, your way. Let us choose. Let us choose to follow. Let us intentionally choose to obey. With heads bowed and hearts opened. I'm praying that the radical shift that has already started in this church will continue. I'm praying that more and more believers will choose. 
will choose to become uncomfortable, will choose to take a stand, will choose to speak the truth, will choose to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. That more and more believers will choose to get up off of that fence and out of that comfort zone. That more and more nominal believers will choose to lay aside the sin that so easily besets you so that you can run with patience the race that is set before you. That you will lay aside the sin to pursue God like you haven't pursued Him in years. I want more. I want more of you, Father. I want more of your presence. I want more of your power. I want more of your spirit moving in my life. I'm willing. I'm willing to take that step. I'm willing to look crazy. I'm willing. I'm willing to be talked about. I'm willing to be rejected. I'm willing to follow. I'm willing to take up my cross and follow you. same spirit of Shadrach, Meshach, and the Bendigo, let it fall on me. Let that same spirit fall on me. Let that spirit fall on this church. That we will not bow to this culture. We will not bow to this culture. We will stand boldly on your word and your way. Speaking the truth as always in love. Not ashamed, not afraid. So Father, let it continue. Not let it begin, but Father, today let it continue. That same spirit that we felt in this room last Sunday when people's hearts were broken and people were on their face repenting before you God let that same spirit of repentance fall in here today this morning the invitation is quite quite simple for anybody in here who wants to give your life to Jesus who wants to make a change in your life who wants to find forgiveness and freedom if you're here and you you know that you're have never been with God or you are not walking with him right now maybe you're the prodigal son and you're sick of the smell of the pig pen sick of the smell feeling the shame of it all sick of it I want to change in my life when I give that invitation I want you to come and find a place to pray let us pray with you his arms are wide open he loves you he's ready to receive you for believers for some strange reason today, my primary call is to you today, believers. Believers, we have simply got to step up. We've simply got to, to take this challenge seriously. The urgency of the hour demands it. If he said it once, he said it 20 times in the last few months. The urgency of the hour is upon us. We don't have as much time as we thought we had. The lost cannot be a byproduct. They have to become a priority. We want to reach lost people. So believers, at this invitation this morning, I just wanted, I would love to see believers flooding to an altar or flooding somewhere to pray, to seek the face of God. God, pour out your spirit in this place. God, let a fire stir up on the inside of us today. Continue what you have begun. Let my passion be like a fire shut up in my bones. Let me be willing to speak the truth and stand for the truth. Love you and serve you all the days of my life. With no shame and no fear. God, I'm choosing. I'm making a choice. So choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve God. We're going to stand boldly proclaiming. And that's where this church is going. kick you off of TikTok, kick you off of Facebook, kick you off of every platform, but keep preaching the truth. Someone needs to hear. 
someone's lost and weary soul needs fresh water. And as you speak the truth, that chain is going to fall off. That addiction is going to break. That depression is going to lift. They're going to be set free. You can hate me now, but you can thank me for eternity. Father, have your way. Holy Spirit, come. We need you. Where's all the Spirit-filled people at? Holy Spirit, come. We need you. All across the building, if you wouldn't mind, everyone in the building, please rise up and stand on your feet. And this is one of those invitations for saint and sinner alike. Saint and sinner alike. As they worship, as they pray, love for you to find a place to pray. Seek the face of God. If you're coming to give your life to the Lord, let us pray with you. If you're coming to seek the face of God, listen to this. I, I said, and somebody needs to hear me, God is calling the others. I said it as a byline in, the, in, a, in a sermon. God is calling the others. Some of you in this room, under, you're hearing what I'm saying. You have a calling on your life. Whether you, whether you want it or not, whether you believe it or not, you have a calling on your life. That's why the devil has kicked the crap out of you for as long as he has. That's why he's tried to keep you from people and keep you from God, keep you from church and keep you from the right way and keep all the wrong things happening in your life because there's a calling on you. There's a, I gotta shut up. There's a light that's on the inside of you that cannot be put out. Cannot be put out and you shouldn't let him put it out. Yes, yes, you are a train wreck. Welcome to the club. Amen? Freaking train wreck right here. You're, you're a train wreck. That's who God uses. That's some of the best people that he uses. He's, all he's got is broken people. So this morning, all my train wreck people in here this morning, find a place to pray. Let God put your, your train on the right track and get your life going. And if you feel like you've got a call on your life, come on and find a place to pray and submit yourself to that calling. And when you get up from that place of prayer, let us know that you've got a calling on your life. Tell him. I'm with you. I'm standing firm with you. We got to move forward in the name of Jesus. Altar workers, if y'all will come. Anybody who has a need for prayer, come on. Y'all lift your voices. Let's pray for revival in this church this morning. Y'all seek the face of God today. Seek the face of God this morning. Worship Him. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.